Hello and welcome to 101 on Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. My guest on this episode is Reverend Mrs. Lori Idahosa. She's an author, the director of Campus Life in Benson Idahosa University and the proprietor at Nathan American Academy Benin. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me on the show. Mm. So I think we should just start um, by finding out how it feels to be associated with the brand and the name Benson Idahosa. Wow. Um, you know, I grew up loving the Idahosa family. Mm. Um, my father and Archbishop Benson Idahosa were friends, but I think they were more like father and son. Um, Papa Idahosa was like a dad to my father. And my father really took him as a spiritual father, as a mentor, as someone that he could talk to about the stages of life and ministry and growth and family. And so for me, I always looked up to them as being, you know, kind of that mentor relationship, that larger than life relationship. So mm -hmm. being associated with them and even carrying their name mm -hmm. to me feels like a massive honor mm -hmm. um, because I, I've always respected the Idahosa name. I've always respected the Idahosa family. And I carry the name carefully um, because I, I know that it, it comes with so much gravity. He's created such an impact in the world. And to be called an Idahosa to me is a big honor. Mm. Okay, so as a director yeah. of Campus Life in Benson Idahosa University and proprietor of the Nathan American Academy, what does a typical day for you look like? Hmm. Well, recently I've taken a bit of a step back and I've made some very intentional decisions to be home with my children more than in the office. Mm. Um, prior to the last year or two, I would get up, I would be in the office by 8 o'clock in the morning, I would work a full long day and I would come home tired and I was realizing that my children needed me. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've kind of readjusted my schedule. Um, while I'm still holding those positions, I'm doing a lot of the things remotely. And so when my kids are home from school, let's say they have a public holiday or there's something going on for some reason, one of the children have to be home. I'm making sure that I'm there for them and I'm there for my husband a lot more than, than what I did when I was in the office consistently. And I found out that I'm able to be just as effective um, working remotely. And it's interesting because when I'm working from home, I'm able to be a bit more effective because I'm not having the distractions of people coming in every five minutes and I'm able to really choose my day and choose the prioritize and prioritize who I really need to see, not just who wants to see me. Mm, so. I think you've seen that to work better for you. For, me it, for me it does because I feel that my family is my first responsibility mm. and so while I see the necessity to be very involved in the school that I started, the Nathan American Academy, and very involved in the Benson Idahosa University where, of course, we're raising over 3,000 students. Mm. Um, I see the, the necessity to be there. I've been able to find a balance to be able to um, strengthen the home front as well as um, serve as a um, boss. Okay. <laughs> How would you describe the education system in Nigeria? I wish that the education system was stronger. Um, you know, I look through some of the textbooks and my heart breaks. Mm -hmm. um, I look through some of the things that, you know, our children are learning and in the public school system and there's just, there's not enough regulation. There's not enough controls. I think that right now in the education system, there's a lot of freedom and there's not enough um, monitoring to make sure that the children are really learning. I think what's happening is, is that students are being taught to memorize. They're being taught to uh, you know, cram information and they're not necessarily learning. And so what I'm finding is that children are, they're not able to reason as well as they would if they were taught concepts and not just memorization. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to change that narrative and we're truly, really working. There's so many schools that are, that are rising up around the nation that are trying to change the narrative and really try to work with the students to make sure that actual learning is taking place. Okay, I'm taking you back to the previous question. You mm -hmm. talked about how you cope. Now, how does your family, your son, your husband, how do they cope with your local and international <laughs> responsibilities? Yeah, um, especially this 2019. Um, this 2019 has been a busy year for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a senior pastor of a church and I went back and I counted how many Sundays I was actually in my church. And um, it wasn't up to 10 this year so far. Mm -hmm. And here we are going into the month of July. Um, 
so I've, I found that this year has been a year of heavy travel for me. Um, but what we, my husband and I have an agreement with the children that if I'm out of town, he's home. If he's out of town, I'm home. Mm. And so the children never have that gap where both of us are absent from the house. And then one of the other things that really works for us is that we do a lot of video calls and video chats. And mm. um, sometimes they even carry children's books with me when I travel so that I can read my kids a bedtime story. Cool. Um, I never let the kids go to bed at night without having that conversation. Mommy loves you. Let's pray together. Let's discuss. And tell me all about your day and you know my kids have access to um, social media they have their own little FaceTime that they can use to call mommy at any time they call me they call my parents in America they call my mother in love they call my husband they have that as soon as they're in the house their Wi-Fi is on and they can call any of us at any time and all of us answer them we don't we don't switch off our phones if we see that it's the kids calling regardless of where we are and I think that it's kind of helped um, the digital media has helped us be able to balance the distance of when I'm maybe not physically there with the family. Okay, let's talk about your book. I mean, you gave me this book recently and yes. I read it, right? And Thank in you your for book, it. this is called Every Woman's Journey. And you talked about how you were given responsibilities and the free will to be independent from the age of 18. You also talked mm -hmm. about how young adult female in the 21st century should have something to show for herself. All this in the chapter of your book, I need to understand what do you hold there when it comes to a woman being independent before marriage? I, you know, if you look at the Bible, um, where it talks about a Proverbs 31 woman, mm -hmm. a Proverbs 31 woman is one seriously hardworking woman. Um, she's buying and selling clothes. She's uh, buying and selling property. She's doing remarkable things. She's, you know, overseeing organization, she's leading people and, and being a boss. And you know what I'm saying? She's, she's doing something. And so I don't feel that a woman needs to wait until she's married before she steps into her calling, okay. before she steps into her destiny, before she steps into who she's really um, created to be. And so I believe that once you're of age, once you're, a, you're an adult, that there's nothing wrong with you stepping out and taking responsibility and, and creating and, and navigating the path that you feel is the destined path for your life. Okay. And so I believe that, that young adult women um, should have the freedom to explore life, business, opportunities, their dreams, their passions. Um, I'm not one of these people who believes that you have to sit under your father's house until you get married. Um, maybe some girls are not responsible enough to handle um, being independent, and that's a decision that they need to make themselves. within themselves and with mm -hmm. their families. But for someone who's responsible, um, I believe take, take every opportunity to do as much as you can because you don't know. You know, sometimes you get married and it's not exactly what you thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have all these dreams and you're like, oh, but I hope that one day, why didn't you do it before you got married? Mm. Do you so want to travel? how do you know who is responsible enough to do this? I'm asking this question mm -hmm. because there seems to be a level of limitation, especially in this part of the world yeah. when it comes to the young um, female adults. There was a conversation going on and you get people's opinion saying a woman is supposed to be caged. She's <laughs> supposed to leave her parents' house mm. to her husband's house because they need to always be under some form of supervision. So that was why my question, in giving them that freedom, is there a limitation to the see, freedom? The way I see it is, okay, the scripture says when you're faithful in the little things, then you can be responsible for the much. Or when you're mm -hmm. faithful in the little God will give you the much. I think that responsibility is something that is earned in stages. Mm -hmm. So when you show that you can be trusted, you can be trusted with more. When you show you can be responsible, you can be responsible with more. Um, for me, um, I chose to move out of my parents' house when I was 17. Wow. Um, and I moved in with a friend of mine and uh, she had an apartment, she was a hairdresser. And I moved in with her and I just began to kind of experience life even before I finished high school um, and be independent from my parents. But even in the independence, I still had a level of respect and, um, and relationship. Um, my first job, I worked for my dad. Um, my second job, I worked in a restaurant as a waitress. 
uh, but my parents were still involved in my life. Even till today, uh, I'm still, I still communicate with them openly. I still, they still know about my finances. Um, they know about my, my choices. I think it comes down to relationship. If you, mm. can, if you can maturely handle a relationship with your parents, I think the parental relationship is important. Okay. And if you can handle maintaining that relationship as well as having your independence, then it's a beautiful marrying of the two, which can hopefully give a woman the opportunity not to be caged. Okay, I think we'll go on a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking about that parental relationship you talked about. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're still on Plus TV Africa and we're chatting with Reverend Mrs. Laurie Idahosa. Before I went on that quick break, what you mentioned parental relationship. Mm. I know in your 18 years of mm -hmm. being around our culture here, you have encountered some level of parental issues. Yes. Not personally, but mm -hmm. in mentoring your members, mentoring right. women you mentor. What would you say is that thing that is missing when it comes to the relationship between parents and their children in this part of the world? It's a, it's a difficult question to answer because every family is unique. Mm -hmm. um, every family has a dynamic that's different than the other family. Um, I think what happens here, though, is that many people have um, jumped into culture and said, culture demands this, instead of looking at it objectively and, said, and saying, you know, really, what can my daughter handle? What responsibilities is she capable of? Mm. Because when you, when you send her into her, father's, your, her husband's house, she should be a well-prepared woman. She, she should be an asset and not a liability. Okay. So you need to give her enough time to develop herself into becoming an asset. An asset has assets. Mm -hmm. She should have some type of net worth. She shouldn't be coming just saying, Daddy took care of me and now my husband's taking care of me. It doesn't, it doesn't really rhyme in my mind. I think that she should be able to stand on her own, be strong, be independent, and be able to add value to her husband instead of just coming as, as another dependent to him. Mm. Okay, still in this book, I enjoyed reading this book, by the way. Thank you for reading And it. you said, um, and I quote, mm -hmm. I want to warn you with the full backing of the word of God that mm -hmm. abortion is not an option. Abortion is a very, very sensitive issue. Of course I mean, around is. the world. Mm -hmm. I want to understand your take on this. So the way I feel about abortion is I feel that God is the giver of life, mm. and that any time life has been conceived, that we have a responsibility to give that life an option, to give that life a chance. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges that I have with the issue of abortion is that people feel that they have their own, they feel like abortion, they feel like the pregnancy is like a sickness, that you treat it, you wash it out, you get rid of it. If it's going to affect your future, if it's going to affect your socioeconomic condition, if it's going to affect your family, then just like you would get rid of malaria or a mole on your face, you get rid of a pregnancy. And pregnancy is different because a pregnancy is life. Mm. And so I'm very careful with how we treat, I think we're too careless with abortion globally. Okay. I think that um, people have just treated it with you know, just simple pills and just washing out their pregnancies when this, this is something that you, you can't have life without having God involved. And I feel that it's, it's essential to give that child an opportunity to live. So the pro-choice movement is standing in the position of saying, you know, it's the woman's right to choose mm -hmm. what she wants to do with her body. I, I have an issue with that because I believe that that child should also be given a voice. Mm. And, you know, because I guess because a major part of it is that I went through years of infertility. And because I went through the years of infertility, I saw early stages of the embryonic growth of a, of a pregnancy. Um, I did IVF six times. And so in the process of doing IVF, I was able to watch how when they insert the sperm into the egg, that naturally, miraculously, it goes from two cells to six cells to eight cells. And you watch this organism grow. And that organism has, has a life of its own. And I feel that and when you implant the organism, the embryo into the, the uterus, you see within a very short period of time, if you do an ultrasound, even in the early weeks of pregnancy, you can see a blink on the screen and you can see a heartbeat. Mm. And it just, I saw that with my own children. And I just began to imagine that, you know, 
many women are just washing out these pregnancies and this is a heart that's beating. Mm. This is a life that actually has, it, it has, it has a whole life of its own, it's growing on its own and I feel that the children need to have an opportunity to be born and you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, if they have, give birth to a baby outside of marriage, it's going to destroy their future, destroy their chances of marriage. And, and that's not fair to the child because a lot of people have successfully had children outside of ideal situations mm -hmm. and have still had remarkable lives. And in my own family situation, my mother um, was a product of a, of a bad relationship. Uh, my grandmother had a relationship with a much older man when she was 16 years old and she got pregnant and that pregnancy is my mom mm. and my grandmom tried to abort her baby she tried several ways and this is back in the 1950s um, and she was unsuccessful with the abortion she ended up giving birth to my mother mm. and I can't imagine the world without my mom I can't imagine <laughs> what would have happened to generations. My children would never be here. Mm -hmm. I would never be here. Yes, it was, it was a horrible situation. My grandmother was 16 years old when she gave birth to my mother and the father was 45. Um, it wasn't ideal in any way, but it was a life. Mm -hmm. And that life has created generations and generations and generations. And I'm grateful that my grandmother was never successful in aborting my mom. Okay, as much as I understand your angle and mm -hmm. how you feel about the um, case of abortion. Even in our constitution in Nigeria, the only time it is permitted or legal is when the life of the mother is um, threatened by the pregnancy. Now, would you say there's any case at all that you would be able to say, okay, it's fine. This is, I'm not in support mm -hmm. of abortion, but this was the only choice at the points to make. I believe at that point when there's med medical necessity mm -hmm. that the man and the woman together need to make a decision with mm. their doctors. Mm -hmm. I was at that place with the birth of my last son. Um, I had a very serious condition of the pregnancy where the, the uh, placenta had attached to the uterus in an unhealthy way. It was called a placenta accreta. And my doctors told me that, look, this is the kind of pregnancy condition that results in maternal death. There's, it's the highest risk for mm. you to deliver this baby. I was advised by doctors in the U.S. I was advised by doctors in Nigeria. I was told to uh, get rid of the pregnancy, that it wasn't safe for me. I had a time that my water broke way too early and I became septic. Um, it was advised by everybody that I should have gotten rid of the pregnancy. And I discussed it with my husband. I discussed it with God. And I felt a strong belief that I should hold on to that pregnancy and I did mm. and that pregnancy resulted in my son Judah that's now six years old. Okay. But it's not, not every case is like my case. Mm -hmm. Some cases are very serious. Some cases it needs to be taken into, the medical advice needs to be taken and, and in that case I don't have a problem with saving the life of a woman mm -hmm. um, but in my case I chose to, to try and um, and stick it out and I did and I'm proud of that decision because I still have my baby. Okay, one of the things I picked up from that same chapter mm -hmm. was when you were listing the different scenarios that could come up and make you think abortion. And then you mentioned even if you have eight children and you think this is too much, yeah. you still keep it. I mean, we have families that are, I mean, we know the situation of poverty in Nigeria. They are in that situation and they know they cannot add one more, even to the six and seven or eight and nine they have. At that point, having to tell them they have to keep the baby, is it not bringing more problem to even the society when, it, when we talk about our population and the issues we have on ground? I don't think Nigeria is gonna suffer because an extra baby is born. Mm. Um, if the family cannot take care of an extra child, if they have eight children, as I think I mentioned in the book, there's so many options that are available. There's adoption. There's allowing another family member to raise the child. There's so many choices that you have outside of killing the baby. Mm. So I believe that that child should be given a chance at life. And if the child has to go into the social services part of the world, which I wish was a bit more developed than what it is right now in Nigeria, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if it has to go into a social services 
situation than what our reality here give there's, the child a chance there's no social <laughs> services you know yeah you have to find a way for yourself mm. even the family member you are depending on are probably struggling also and at that point you feel okay this is the only way i probably need to take care of the ones i have make sure they have good health good education and be sure of it however if this is the only way we want to look at it and say okay abortion is a no-no would you agree because i've seen christian women say yeah. contraception is a no-no is that a no-no too I'm not against contraception. Okay. I believe that now that's a very controversial issue because, mm. of course, we know the Catholic Church is against it. Mm. The Protestant Church is for it. It's, you know, it's, a very, it's all over the place when it comes to religion. Mm. Um, but as far as contraception is concerned, I believe that we have a responsibility to control okay. if we can control. Now, if a, if a conception has already taken place, mm. then that's not contraception. That's, in my opinion, it's abortion or it's murder. Mm -hmm. But if you're controlling your ovulation, if you're controlling your menstrual cycles, if you're um, controlling the access of sperm, if you're doing, you know... If you're spacing. Yes, if you're spacing. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see anything... I can't find spiritually or economically or anywhere that it's wrong to, um, to protect yourself from unwanted pregnancies prior to conception. Okay. Let's leave abortion and contraception. <laughs> <laughs> what is the role of Christians in nation building? Christians and Christianity. What do you think wow. is our role? I think we have a massive role. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that all religions have a massive role. I don't believe it's just Christians. Mm -hmm. I believe that all humans have a responsibility to build their nation, mm -hmm. to speak well of their nation, to look for ways that we can improve our society and improve our communities. I, I don't believe it should be a Christian or a non-Christian issue. I think that nation building is a human issue. Mm. And I believe that all of us have a responsibility to create the world that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And we should all step up and we should speak well of our nation. We should speak well of our leaders. We should elect leaders that we're proud of. We should elect based on values and morals and and the voices and the de decisions that we know these people are going to take, not just based on popularity or buying votes or whatever the case may be. I think that, that our electoral system should be, should be more controlled mm -hmm. and, um, and we should be wiser when it comes to how we, how we bring people into leadership. Okay. You've been married for 18 to 19 years. Congratulations yes. on that. Thank you. What would you say really makes it work when it comes to family and marriage? For me, I would say the number one thing that makes my marriage work is communication. Mm. Um, Feb is my best friend. And, you know, just yesterday we had a sensitive issue that came up and he asked me, he said, Laurie, listen, just tell me the truth. If there's anything, I'm going to stand by you. Just let me know so that we know what we're dealing with. Mm. And I think that kind of trust, that kind of friendship, that kind of rapport where I know that, I know that Feb's got my back. He's my best, he was my best friend before we married. He's my best friend after. Mm. And I've been able to see throughout the seasons of marriage that he'll fight for me and I'll fight for him. And not because he's my husband and I'm not gonna be divorced. And No, I'll fight for him because he's my friend. And we talk, we talk, and we talk, and we talk, and we talk, and we talk. We talk about everything, things that we like and things that we don't like to talk about, the sensitive issues and the easy issues. Um, we do everything together. We, we're, we're friends. And I think communication and friendship is, for me, the, the central force that's kept my marriage as strong as it is. Mm. I'm going to ask this next question because I feel like, oh, I know that you have experience. Okay. What does miracle mean to you? Miracle. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> well, for me, um, a miracle is something that you cannot do on your own. Mm. It requires a supernatural act. Mm. And for me, my thing that I couldn't do on my own was have a child. Uh, I did everything I could. I, my tubes were blocked. I had PCOS. My husband had sperm issues. Together, we were 99.9% .9 infertile. Mm. And the doctors told us we needed IVF, and that's what we did. Um, and it resulted in a pregnancy, and we, I've told the story before that that child died after birth. Um, I needed a miracle because I couldn't even go back and do another IVF because I had just had a C-section. And when God gave me a pregnancy through natural conception, to me, it was one of the biggest evidences that God truly is God and that miracles still happen because 
I knew from the scientific perspective that it was impossible. Mm. And when something impossible happens, I believe there's a, a, a supernatural act that takes place. That's what I call the miraculous. Mm. And I've experienced it. And it gives me faith and it gives me courage to believe that other people can experience the miraculous as well because I've experienced it. Not once, not twice, but three times. Um, and I just have seen firsthand that the same power that Jesus had in the days of the Bible still exists today. The same miracles that he did then, he's still doing today. And I'll never forget my first miracle that I saw. I was just, what was I, nine years old, and I was in Indonesia as a missionary with my parents. And there was a little girl that had a cleft palate lip. It was, her lip was twisted like this. And I saw her, and my heart was just beating with compassion, like this little girl looks disfigured. And I took the little girl to my dad, because my dad was praying for miracles and seeing deaf ears open and all these great things, blind eyes. And so I took this little girl to my dad, and I said, Dad, you know, can you pray for her? My dad said, no, you can pray for her. And I'm like, but I'm, <laughs> I'm like nine. Mm -hmm. you know. And he's like, no, it, it's the same God in me that's in you. The same power that's in me is the same power that's in you. And he had me lay hands on the little girl's mouth. And I watched God recreate the lip on this little child. And I'll never forget it. And I think for me, it, it, was, it, it burned something on the inside of my psyche and my belief as a child, which I've carried through into my adult life, that miracles still happen. Mm. I watched them. I watched with my eyes the miraculous, even from my childhood all the way through my adolescence. Mm. I saw remarkable miracles. I traveled with the Archbishop Benson Itahosa on crusade grounds and watched people that were lame getting up and walking and watching blind eyes opening, literally milky blind eyes being completely cleared off. So when it came time to believe for my own miracle, it was easier to have that kind of faith because mm -hmm. I saw God do it for other people. And I felt like if he can do it for them, why can't he do it for me? And when he didn't do it for me for six years, I can tell you I was a little frustrated with him mm. because I was like, you know, God, you're, you're, you can, I was still praying for people and seeing them healed. And me, I'm standing and I'm asking God, give me children. He wasn't giving them to me. And I think that in the miraculous realm, it all has to do with his timing. Mm. We can't force God's hand. His timing is his timing. His ways are his ways, and it's important for us as children of God and as believers in him to trust and to have faith and to have that confidence that he's going to do it in his own way and mm -hmm. believe that his way is better than our ways. Okay, I like that you said looking at or seeing those things while growing up, seeing mm -hmm. those miracles helped you believe and understand Absolutely. that he's going to do yours. As he's doing others, I mean, why not mine? Yeah. But there are people that are struggling with their Christian lives. Yeah. There are people that are, should I call them the doubting Thomas of now yeah. until I see. So what advice do you have for them, especially when they're struggling with holding on to faith, especially mm -hmm. when they're expecting something and it's not happening and they're struggling and wondering, can I hold on? The what reason why we struggle is because we allow the, the seeds of doubt into our mind. And so I think it's so important for us to control the influences that we have. Mm. The more that you're listening to stories of negativity, of loss, of devastation, of hurt, the more that you're listening to things, the more that your faith gets crushed and silenced. So what you listen to, what you read, what you digest, what you pay attention to has a big effect on whether or not your faith is going to grow. And as the Bible says, you only need faith like a grain of a mustard seed. Mm. So you don't need to have the great faith of Itahosa to see the same kind of miracles that we've seen in, in his life and in our lives. Mm. Unfortunately, that's how much we can take. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time, Mrs. Idahosa. Thank you for having me. All right, we've been chatting with Reverend Mrs. Lori Idahosa. She's the director of Campus Life in Benson Idahosa University. My name is Elsie Godwin, and thank you for watching.